Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our text for this morning is from Romans chapter 7. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. This is our text. Dear friends, sisters, and brothers in Christ Jesus, So we have been looking at Paul's letter to the Romans over these last several weeks, and we come to chapter 7. Last week we asked, Paul asked us the question of uh, whether we should, uh, how do you say, whether we should go on sinning since we're under under grace and not the law. Uh, Do we have a, does that give us a free pass? And what was his answer? By no means, means, right? You see that comes back this week, right? That, that, uh, that response. Um, so we are not to go on sinning, which means we are called right to uh, a transformed life, right? To present our members to God for righteousness, right? And this requires um, this requires a, a transformation. And he continues on that that theme in chapter seven, and this is a notoriously difficult chapter. Uh, we're going to get part of it this week and part of it next week, although I'm going to try to, I'm trying to cover it all this week because we're going to take a break in our sermon from Paul next week for just a little bit. Um, but Paul is looking at why, why the law is, is insufficient to, um, to bring about that, that transformation that God requires. Right? That's what he's, he's talking to. And I suspect he's addressing here in Rome, he knows that a lot of the Christians in Rome come out of a Jewish background. They very appropriately have a very high regard and reverence for God's law. Right? That you, you, that part of, that, part of that, that culture and piety is what we heard in our psalm, that reverence for, for God's law and his statutes. Um, and, and so they've heard about this Paul, right? They probably heard, yeah, he says that he says that you don't have to follow the law, right? And, and they, they're skeptical, maybe, about Paul. And so, so Paul is explaining a little bit more about his understanding of the gospel and how it relates to the law. And, and I want to suggest here that, that Paul addresses, at least indirectly, he, he addresses sort of two ways, two, two mistaken ways that, that people try to address the human predicament. Um, when, when people find themselves, I don't know, trapped in um, a- addressing sin, right, and the, the condemnation of the law and the need for change in their lives, I think there are two kinds of ways that, that people tend to go. Uh, there's, there's the one way that, that tries to double down on the law, that says, like, what you need, right, what you need to change your life, what our society needs is more rules, right? And then there's another, there's another tack that people take, which is say, what we need is to get rid of the rules, to get rid of the laws. And Paul addresses both of those in chapter seven. Now, I think that, that maybe among, um, I'm going to guess that, that among a lot of Christians, maybe the, the initial our initial reaction to the human predicament is to say what we need are, what we need are, more, are more rules, right? What we need is to, to emphasize God's law. You need, to, you need to try harder. You need to try harder. And we see this, I think, in some of our, our societal debates, too. I think, you know, I, I think that, that putting the best construction on it, it might be, be this kind of impulse that's behind the desire to, like, have the Ten Commandments posted, right, like in, our, in public places, right? Because if people were reminded of the Ten Commandments, then they would behave better. How does that work? Yeah, why not? Because people still sin, right? People still sin. Does, does, does reinforcing... Now, don't get me wrong, right? Like, rules are... Rules are necessary in the society, 
But do rules change people's hearts? No, right? Um, you know, you can use rules and, and the, the punishment that rules threaten to enforce, right? You can, you can control people's outward behavior with rules up to, a, a, to an extent, right? But can you change people's hearts? No, right? And you, what you do is you run into the problem that, um, you run into the problem that, that Tiny talked about, right? What I, what I call the cookie problem. And you guys all know this, from, you know, when your, your mom said, right, oh, you know, those, right, those cookies up there are not for you. What do you want? You want those cookies, right? You want those cookies. And this, and Paul, right, Paul says this is how, how the law works, is that, that this is how, how bad, right, it's not that the law is bad, right, the law the law is, is good, right? The law reflects the will of God. But the law cannot, cannot give you a heart that, that wants the things of God, right? All the law can really do is by, by setting forth God's expectations, what, what the law does is it, it, it diagnoses your sin is what it does, right? And it shows you a mirror of, of, your, own, of your own sinfulness. And, and if that weren't bad enough... The sinfulness in us, right? This is this is how, right? This is how messed up we are, right? That that the sinfulness in us is is aroused by the law itself, right? So as soon as the commandment says, "Don't, right? Don't do that," then the sinfulness in you says, "I want that," right? And we all know this is a very common, common human experience, a very common human experience. And so Paul says, right, that that doubling down on the law is not the solution to the human problem. So some people go in the other, other direction and they'll say, well, right, if, if, if I'm feeling all this guilt, right, that, you know, maybe the law itself is the problem, right? And, the, and then what we need to do is we need to, to free ourselves, right, to, to cast off the shackles of the law and, and do what we want. And, and I think that's been, maybe that's, that's been sort of the, the trajectory of, of modernity is, is kind of in that direction, I would venture to say. Although, I mean, it's, it's interesting because as, uh, you know, I think in many ways we live in a society that considers itself very, you know, liberated in that way. But also, if you look at it in many ways, it's also very, very moralistic and very legalistic, just with an emphasis on, on different things, right? As I've said before, I, and I didn't make this up, but I... I, I always come back to it, right? That we live in a society where, where everything is permitted and nothing is forgiven. Here's part of the problem with that. How many of you, I don't want to call anybody out. How many of you find yourselves doing things that you know you shouldn't do? Yeah. How many of them, this is probably more common, how many of you find yourselves not doing things that you know you should do? <laughs> and this is exactly what Paul says, right, in the, the second part of this chapter, he says, right, the, the good that I want to do, I do not do, right, and, and the evil that I do not want to do, I keep on doing. And Paul says, if that's, if that's the case, it means that I agree with the law, right? The fact that you, the fact that you have a bad conscience, right? If, if your behavior were just, right, if it were all a matter of like, you know, whatever, whatever you want to do is good, right? You do you, as they say. But we, the fact that we have a bad conscience means that, that in our innermost self, we believe that there is a standard of right and wrong, a transcendent standard of right and wrong outside of us. And a lot of people wouldn't put it that way, but I guarantee you that that, that is a, a universal human experience. Right? That we, we all believe that, there, that there, some things are right and some things are wrong. Right? Not just for me, but universally. 
And, and we all find that we don't live up to those things. And so our consciences serve as a witness to the law. They serve as a witness to the fact that, that there is a, a right and wrong in the universe. And that, that very often we find ourselves on the wrong side of that divide. And getting rid of God's law doesn't cure that problem. All it means is that I can't see it very clearly, right? I have this sort of sense of unease, but I, I have a hard time articulating exactly what it is, right? It's kind of like, you know, in, in that case, getting rid of God's law, not preaching God's law, which is, you know, again, is a solution I, I think that, that quite a few churches take, is that you, it's kind of like you're not feeling well, but you choose not to go to the doctor because you don't want to know what's wrong with you, Right? Which is probably a very human experience, but it's not going to help you get better. And so here we are, we're stuck with these, this, these problems, right? These two non-solutions, right? We can't, we can't get ourselves out of our predicament by getting rid of the law, but we also can't get, of, get, rid of our, get ourselves out of our predicament by doubling down on the law. We need, we need something else. And, and Paul hints at it here, he, he gets into it more, more completely in chapter 8, but here he says, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. Right? We have been released from the law because, because Jesus fulfilled the demands of the law on our behalf. And Jesus bore the full condemnation of the law on our behalf. Right? There's no judgment any more in God's law for you because it all fell on Jesus. And you've been united with him. And so Paul says, right, in your baptism, you, you died with Christ on the cross. And so the law no longer has any judgment against you, which means, Paul says, that sin no longer has a claim on you. And he says, now we're actually able, this is the amazing thing, is, is that once God has removed us from that problem. He's removed us from the judgment of the law. He's removed us from the claim of sin. Now we're actually able to do the things, we're be able to begin to do those things that God wants us to do. We're able to do them because God has placed his spirit in our hearts. Right? And so we're no longer, we're no longer ruled by fear, but we are, are moved by the Spirit of God's love within us. And that may seem strange to you, but you actually know this from, from experience, right? Especially those of you who are parents or those of you who are teachers, um, you've had this experience. What, what's more effective when you're trying to, you know, when you want kids to do what you want them to do, right? Does, does it work better to, um, to sort of threaten them into doing it, right? Or, or does it work better when, when, because of the relationship you have and the love you have, that, that right, they, they do that out of, out of their love for you, right? Their desire to be with you, right? Um, and, and as parents, right, we've experienced both of those things, right? Because our kids, like the rest of us, are both saint and sinner, right? And so sometimes the law is necessary, right? But sometimes we see the other where, where we do something together just, right, because of our, our love together, our love for each other. And, and that's much more pleasant, right? And much more effective than having to say, you know, if you don't do this, you're going to have time out, right? In the same way, what God wants for us is not mere outward obedience. What God wants for us, from us is a transformation that goes all the way down, all the way down. And the way that he's done that is by, by removing the condemnation of the law so that instead we can know the fatherly love of God And so our motivation is no longer fear, right? Our motivation is love. Because you, in Jesus, God has made known to you that you have a God who loves you so much that he has given everything he has so that nothing can separate you from him. And he has placed his spirit in your heart. The spirit of adoption, Paul says, so that that you can call on him as father. 
You can call on him and his Father. And that that same spirit is going to empower you to want to, to live like God, right? To, to carry that love of God into the world, to share it with other people. And so it's my prayer for you that you would know that freedom, which is, which is true freedom, the freedom of being children of God, who have become God's children, not by, not by obeying the law, but by trusting God by trusting in Jesus. In his name, amen.